This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale, I'm a film critic and writer and today I'm going to be talking to Robert Sellers, a man who has written a large number of books, uh, histories of handmade handmade films, biographies of Oliver Reed and Peter O'Toole, a collective biography of sort of drinking stories called Hollywood Hellraisers, just loads of, loads of fascinating books and now he's the author of a new book called 1971, The Best Year uh, Ever in Movies, told by, and he's He's collected a hundred movies to bolster his argument. It's a fa- it's a brilliant read, really, really interesting, and it can be read as a dip in, dip out sort of book, or it can be read all the way through as I did. Anyway, we'll let uh, Robert talk about it. Uh, it's a great conversation, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. If you enjoy the episode, please remember to like, subscribe, review, follow me on Twitter at dr john t i'm also on blue sky if you want to follow me there if you have had enough of elon musk's nonsense uh but before you do any of that please enjoy the episode I tell you now, yeah, I'm, I'm, I much prefer asking questions to answering them. I have to say, yes, <laughs> right, yeah, I imagine because you've done. You, I remember reading um, a book of yours from some years ago called Hellraisers, mm. which I thought that was my. I think that was my fir- the first book I read of yours, mm. and that was such an entertaining book, and yet also at, at the beginning very entertaining, and then by the end of it, kind of tragic. Well, I I got one interesting uh, letter was passed on to me from the, the publisher and it was uh, this guy who said he'd done it tried everything over the years to give up drinking and he'd been to Alcoholics Anonymous and he'd, uh, he'd done hypnotism and he'd done all these things and he read read my book and that, that's that, that was that was the thing that he said that made him realize what am I doing because if it can fell people like Burton these wonderful amazing people then what's it going to do to little old me I better stop so he so I, I, it was quite interesting that, that that it had an impact in that in that way because it was it's it was purely a a piece of fluff really. It's sort of a great I, I my concept for it was for it to be sort of like a, a greatest hits album. So instead of trawling through all of the Rolling Stones albums, you just get the greatest hits. You know, so it was almost like a greatest hits album, just all the best bits of their lives really. Um, so but. So for it to have that kind of effect on somebody, um, a personal effect was quite was was nice in a way that you maybe save someone's life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I, I just found there were so many moments of real sort of tragedy. Like, he, I'm actually, he, he probably read my next book and went straight back on the bottle. But there we what, go. What was your next book after that? <laughs> I don't. I was the <laughs> Hollywood version, the Hollywood, um, ah. which we, they made a mistake because it, it was called Bad Boy Drive, which was a, quite a clever title. Uh-huh. But it should have been called, and the publisher said this later on, because the paperback was called Hollywood Hellraisers, and they said it should have been called Hollywood Hellraisers to start with, because it was, so this is the Hollywood version. So Bad Boy Drive, it sort of got lost a bit. And it, again, it was four people, you know, instead of the original Hellraisers, Burton, O'Toole, Ollie, and uh, Harris, the Hollywood version was uh, Brando, Nicholson, BT, and Hopper. And I, I think it's... it's it's just as good a book, actually. It's, it's it's much darker book because I think with Burton and Ollie and people of that and, and O'Toole and Harris, of course, there are dark elements uh, like Richard Harris throwing a wardrobe at his wife, things like that, which mm. are quite... But there, there's a lot of sort of juvenilia in a, a sort of, you know, schoolboy behaviour kind of thing. Whereas with the Hollywood crowd, it was it's much darker. It's more drug-related, drug, drug related, you know? So it was a bit more... Um, dark, yeah, but it's just as good a book, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just find that the way you you have this moment where you know people like Richard Harris, you have you have all these wonderful stories, and by the end of the book, Richard Harris can't remember. You know, he sort of gets to a house and he says, "Oh, I love this house. This is great." And they say, "Well, you've been here like five years ago. You were here for two weeks." <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's certain certain. Well, David Bowie famously says that he can't remember recording the Station Station album because he was on cocaine at the time. Right. And it was the same with these guys. That some of the 
films. They couldn't remember making making films, you know, uh, which is extraordinary in a way, isn't it? When you think you, when the actual process of making a film or an album, going in every day to a studio or a film set, learning dialogue, acting scenes, discussing scenes, and then not for that all to <laughs> go is quite a, quite a, quite astonishing, really. Yeah, I think I, I read somewhere that Stephen King said the same thing about Cujo that he he was mm. completely drunk when he wrote yeah. it and he doesn't remember writing it. Mm. Yeah, when did you start writing, Robert? When was your uh, you know how did you how did you get into the business? Well, my my original ambition was to be an actor um, because I, I'd grown up loving loving movies. Um, I was lucky in that respect that my mum used to allow me to stay up and watch the Friday night horror films that used to be on. Um, so I had this love of cinema and it was always a special, growing up in the seventies, it was always a special event to go and see a movie. Not like nowadays where it's all multiplexes or they watch it all on streaming on their phones. Then you actually went to a cinema and it was a whole event. You had the adverts and then you got up and got your popcorn and the ice cream lady came down. And, and the curtains were closed and the curtains opened. And it was almost like um, a performance in itself, you know, mm. as opposed to, to the film as well. So um, so it was a love of going to the cinema and a love of movies. So, um, yeah, I, I got into drama at school um, and wanted to be an actor. And that didn't go anywhere, unfortunately. But um, so I started writing about movies. Instead of being in them, I sort of started writing about them. I tried to get into the, the film industry. But um, it was uh, like it is now as a closed shop. Um, so I started, yeah, I just started writing, sending stuff off to film magazines when we still had them. Um, instead of now, we just got one, isn't it? Isn't it Empire is still the last one step. The sight and sound we have. Exactly, yeah. But oh. the, the, you're right. It's not. It's it's not exactly a, a huge market. Yeah, I don't really don't really um, look at sight and sound as a film magazine, really. <laughs> I mean, I prefer the empire type, you know, yeah, because uh, that's my journalism. I'm not a, I'm not a sort of a sight and see. I think there's two two kind of film journalists, your sight and sound or your empire, or in respect or a play, um, photo to play, film review, you know. I much prefer that kind of thing to the sight and sound, sort of where everything is analysis and uh, I much prefer anecdotal things and stuff that happen, production stories and things like that. And going in, talking about hell raises, it's all just drunken stories. There's no analysis of why some why they're drinking. I don't mm. I don't go into that whatsoever. I mean, some criticism because of that, but I think in itself, it's 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 um it's a a grave tale. Mm. Uh, you don't need to analyze why they're drinking. It's it's just it is, it is what it is. But um, so I see. I so I started sending off um articles to film magazines and. Like um, I think the film review, yeah, it was film review that got in touch, and they thought I had something, and I started writing articles for film review, um, and then doing film reviews for Enemy, and um, then I sort of got articles in newspapers and things, and then I started writing books. Um, I'm afraid <laughs> I've carried on writing books. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I mean it doesn't pay. It doesn't pay the bloody mortgage. I tell you that, God, no, but. Um, it sort of keeps me off the streets. It's the only thing I can do. I mean, I literally can't do anything else. I li literally can't do anything else. This is all I can do. I mean, I've I've had jobs in the past, um, office jobs and things. I'm bloody hopeless. But I can I can I can write a book. I can I can do research. I can interview people. I can. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. I can put it all together. I think I think we sort of people are made for certain things, aren't they? You know, people are very good at certain jobs. And I'm, I'm just, maybe it's a love of English as well. When I was at school, I loved English. I loved to um, composition. I love writing stories. So I, I always, I'm, so even though I'm writing non-fiction, I try and write it as a, as a narrative, as a story. So again, this is the, the steering away from the sight and sound kind of aspect of where, where you're analyzing things. I'd rather tell a story um, for the, for the, the reader to sort of be involved in it and, um, and follow it as a narrative. You know, even though it's a non a piece of non-fiction. Yeah. That that's where I I think your your books absolutely shine. I love I love the Hellraisers, but I um, I read the uh, Oliver Reed biography um, that you did uh, as well, and I was kind of like there was a bit of me that was sort of going, um, do I want to go deeper into this guy's life because I've already read the parts in Hellraiser, 
and then um and in hellraisers but then um yeah hellraisers are different hellraisers are different tell you funny because you just got them too confused you said hellraiser is a it's a funny story we did um talk about empire the empire did this huge sort of convention oh years ago a couple of years after hellraiser came out i think it was at the o2 um it was over a weekend and there were lots of there were film showings there were panels and everything like that and we we went no no this was when the graphic novel came out you know they did a graphic novel of hellraisers which was published about eight years afterwards and it was it was in conjunction with this and they invited me and the the guy the illustrator jake who did the amazing artwork in the book to give a little lecture a talk and we'd done this a few things we'd done it at latitude and we'd done it at various places where i sort of discussed funny stories and he would in the back he would have a sheet of paper and he would draw i saw i'd do 10 minutes of burton he would draw a burton on this huge bit of paper and then i did do oliver reed do funny oliver reed stories and he would draw oliver reed so at the end of the talk it was half an hour or so he'd, he'd have drawn the four people and we gave them away to the people who wanted came up to the stage so it's quite popular anyway we, we did we were asked to do this at the empire thing and two people turned up and they thought it was hellraiser they thought it was something to do with hellraiser they're ex- expecting a, they're, expe- <laughs> they're expecting a um i don't know talk about the the, the horror film hellraiser and we said no no it's hellraisers as in as in and they thought oh oh all right but i will stay anyway so they watched it and they, they obviously got two two of these artworks each so whether they've still got them which, which of those actors uh would you think of as your favorite from you know harris o'toole burton uh and who was the last one? Oh, Reed, Oliver Reed. Who who do you think oh, you you like the most? That's so, so difficult because they're all amazing, aren't they? But I think I think maybe Ollie Special is sort of one of the lads, wasn't he? he? Was a bit more sort of working class, a bit more blue collar. The others were a bit. Er- I mean, they all came. They all came from um, humble beginnings, but they sort of had a an air about an air of grace about them, didn't they? Whereas Ollie was was, was you know they they. Gin and tonics and champagne, wasn't it? Ollie was your real ale guy, wasn't he? So um, a bit more down to earth. So I've got affection for Ollie. Um, but they were all amazing, amazing people. Great actors as well. You know, we forget, you know, amazing actors. Yeah. Um, there was that interview, BBC Four, uh, re-showing a lot of Parkinson's interviews. And yesterday or the two days ago, they had an amazing interview with Burton, which is on YouTube, I think, which you should anyone listening should should watch. He's, he's there on his own. And there, there was no audience. I think I read that there was no audience. He didn't want to do it in front of an audience. So to get some people in the audience for some kind of reaction, I think they got all the cleaners from BBC Television Centre to sit in the audience. So there's about 10 or 15 cleaners. So you do hear some kind of reaction. Um, and it's an amazing interview. It's, it's, it's a very illuminating interview, yeah. But they they they're terrible. They were they were tall tellers. They could be, they, they did exaggerate. So it's very some of these stories are maybe should we say exaggerated to some degree. I was gonna I was gonna say how did you sort of you know um, sift through because yeah there's a as soon as people start telling stories about drinking there's everything is times by ten you know? absolutely yeah, absolutely. I mean I, with Hellraisers I'm afraid I didn't care if it was a great story I put it in. Was it, was it Randolph Hearst, isn't it? Who say, you know, something about printing the legend, you know, print the truth or print the legend, always print the legend, you know. I think it's some, something along those lines. So, but I think when I came to doing um, Ollie's book and also I did a, a big biography on Peter O'Toole, I think when you're doing a, a, a proper biography on the one person, I think then you have to be a bit more serious about it. Mm. Um, so, yes, any story that had to be, substantiated by somebody else yeah but what was quite nice was um some of the more ex- ex- um, e- extraordinary stories from hellraiser hellraisers uh, <laughs> was um it was nice to to get that coll- collaborator shall we say yes um mm. there's there's one great one of my favorite oliver reed stories was when he was uh, filming the three musketeers mm. in in spain and he was saying at this very very posh Restaurants, restaurant. You'd have to edit that, wouldn't you? He was staying in a very posh hotel, right? And in the foyer where the restaurant was, where people had their breakfast and lunch and dinner, there was this huge um, pond of, of of tropical fish. And one in the dead of night, one day he came down at night and he took all the goldfish out of the 
out of this um, tank, took them upstairs and put them in his bath. And then he got a load of carrots and with with a knife all night um, fashioned the, these sort of carrot shaped fish, and he popped them back into the into the pond, into the into this huge tank. Whether it was a tank or whether it was a pond, you know, ornamental pond. Or and anyway, what happened was in the morning when everyone's having their breakfast, he he, he arrived and then dived in. And came his head came out of the water with one of these fish in his mouth. You know, it caused massive panic and consternation. And the police were called, and he was dragged away, screaming, "I'm a musketeer!" Um, and it was such an outrageous story. But it had to go in, whether it was true or not. It had to go in. And but I interviewed Michael York for the Oliver Reed book, um, who, of course, was in Three Musketeers. And I mentioned this story, and he said, "I was there. I saw it happen." So. It was lovely to get um, somebody who was actually there can say yes. I some I sometimes wonder if some of these stories are amazing to read and amazing to enjoy in retrospect. But if I was actually you know making a film with Oliver Reed, I'd be terrified. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. I don't know if I'd be able to 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 stand him. People were terrified of him. Yeah, people would, would have a the one the amazing thing with Oliver Reed was that people would talk to me and say that yeah, they could have they, they could just about handle one evening with him and that was it. But the thing was with Ollie, he, that was every night for him. But whereas one that was enough, you know. I spent one night with him, never again. But th- that was his whole life that he that he lived like that, which is, is extraordinary. Really, when he was on set, I think when he was at home, not really. I mean, when he was at home, he was just as bad actually. Um, he had the this this gang of workers who he had this lovely house that was being renovated and it took about ten years to renovate it because he, he kept saying are the bricks you know the, are the walls finished yet or have you finished that and they said no because he keep taking us to the pub he'd, he'd come round and say off to, we're off to the pub sod the wall we're off to the pub so it took years and years to build to renovate this place because because they were spent spent most of their time in the pub did you ever get an opportunity to meet Oliver. No, no, I'm, I've, I, I've, it was a great privilege and honour to, to to speak to all his family, to his to his his son and daughter and his his brothers. So that was a real real honour, and his 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 wife and two wives actually. Um, so that was I never met any of them. No, I, I saw O'Toole many times on stage in the Jeffrey Bernard and also in a George Bernard Shaw Man and Superman. He's, out of the four, he's probably my favourite actor. Of the four, O'Toole, um, there was always something artificial about him and and over the top. He wasn't he wasn't Brando at all, was he? He wasn't a naturalistic actor, very much a theatrical, even on film, a very theatrical actor. And I've li- I love that kind of acting. I love that sort of theatrical style of acting, which all four of them had. Um, less so Oliver actually. Burton was always a bit over the top, wasn't he? As was Harris. Ollie is actually quite a minimalist actor, isn't he? If you look at films like The Brood. Superb in that, particularly the opening scene. There's an opening scene, isn't there, where where he's this therapist, isn't he? And he's he's doing this therapy thing with this patient. Fantastic acting. He was he was very underrated as an actor. Yeah. So yeah, I thought I saw, but yes, I never never met them socially. No, unfortunately. Or, or fortunately, depending on. <laughs> or, but it would have been lovely to have, to have, to have met because they're heroes of mine growing up. Right, so it would have been right. too. I, I, I almost met Harris um, when he was doing Reviving Camelot in the early 80s in London, um, unbeknown to me as a, as a um, birthday treat. I must have been about 14. My parents bought me a ticket to see, and it was I think it was the last night or something in the West End. I went to see it, but unfortunately the, the, the night before, I think we'd been drinking, he fell out of a taxi so it was so it was um, out of action, so it's stand in. So that was disappointing. And years later, I, I found out that had Harris been there, I was going to go to the dressing room and meet him. They'd arranged for me to go in and meet him and talk. And yeah, you know, so that never happened. So that was a real shame. Yeah. But that would have been incredibly intimidating. I'm not sure. <laughs> wow, that would have been very intimidating. That that that's an amazing sort of um, you know, close call. You got almost 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 got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I've been. I, I went to a few stage doors and never, never met them. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I, I do. I am sort of. I do get nervous around famous people. Although there's not many famous people left in the world anymore, but sort of they're all dead, aren't they? The Christopher Lees, the Peter Cushing's, the the Connerys. Kane is left, but yeah, I remember meeting. Obviously, doing a lot of magazine work and books. I, I get to interview an awful lot of people um, and meeting 
and interviewing people like Roger Moore is is a, a real you know, it's quite it's, it's quite intimidating. It's, it's quite I get quite nervous. And I remember going to see Roger Moore, and I was waiting for about ten minutes in the foyer for him to come down from his. Yes, Mr. Moore will be down in a moment, which is make, already makes you shake. And then yeah, the, there he came out of the lift, and but you know you, you get over that, and they're they're very good at making you feel sort of. And you want to say, you know, you want to do a. I'm not worthy kind of thing, you know. But <laughs> must hate, I'm sure they hate that. They must hate that when, when people sort of grovel around them, you know, saying, you don't know what you've meant to me, blah, blah, blah. They must hate that. I don't know, because they get it all the time, don't they? But sometimes when I'm interviewing people and I do I do say, look, you know, I, I was a big fan of yours and you know, when I was growing up and you meant a lot to me, I, I have done that. I interviewed Graham Garden recently, the goodies and I grew up loving Monty Python and the goodies when I was a kid. The goodies especially. I loved the goodies. They were my heroes. I bought all the annuals and the albums. But people who don't know the goodies, they were really huge in the 70s. They were sort of on a par with Python in a way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember goodies came before, prop, but not before in terms of time, but in terms of me watching them. I watched the yeah, goodies. Absolutely. They, were, they were our Python. Exactly. I and our Python generation. I watched as a repeat. We were too late for Python, weren't exactly. we? Exactly, yeah. The repeats. But yeah. we, they, they were our Python, you know. Definitely. And I had to say to Graham at the end of my interview that, you know, you meant so much to me because I was such a huge fan. So it's, it's nice in a way to say that, yeah. And they, I think they do appreciate it, yeah. yeah. I think there's a way of saying it. You know, there's a way of not, uh, I mean, it's about, I I always try to maintain a sort of level of um, professionalism when I'm uh, yes. meeting yes. people and it's like, okay, I've got a job to do. I've got, I've got to get this. That's why you're there, isn't it? Exactly. That's yeah. why you're, you're there to interview for, for whatever, not to go, oh my God, it's so, uh, I remember going to see, um, interviewing uh, Donald Sutherland. I was, I was doing an article mm. about book now for Uncut Magazine, which is no more. That was really, really nervous there yeah mm. and i just something ridiculous he, he blew his nose and he and he was in it was in the he was in the west end of the at the time and he was in his dressing room for after the matinee or something and i'd gone to see him to interview him and he blew his nose and he and he tried to throw the the tissue paper into the bin that was at the other side of the dressing room and he missed mm. and, he, and he was went up to get it. i said no no i'll do, i almost said it would be my pleasure to do it but i didn't it would be my privilege to put your the royal snot rag you know, soiled, <laughs> but I did. I, I, I got up and said, "No, I'll, I'll do it." And, yeah, because it's the least I could do, Mr. Sullivan, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Because, because I, the thing is, I've grown up watching these people's films. I've, I've grown up watching "Don't Look Now" and Kelly's Heroes and Dirty Dozen and Eagle Has Landed, and you know they've, they're part of my life, part of growing up. And when you actually meet them and talk to them. I think it's an extraordinary thing. I did this book on ITC, the TV shows of ITC, which is Lou Grade, who did all of them, the Persuaders and the Saints and Prisoners and all the Jerry Anderson shows. And I grew up loving Thunderbirds and all of those shows. And I interviewed Jerry Anderson for, for the book. And at the time, he had an office at Pinewood. And because he did about 10 shows for ITC, there was no way we could do it in one interview. And I ended up going to Pinewood about six six times to do these long interviews with with Jerry, and that was a real pleasure to to be able to really grill someone like that and all the minutiae of the show and talk to him about how he came up with all these ideas and stuff in real detail. And by the end, you know, he was very open and was telling me stuff that he hadn't told anyone before. He said, look, I've never told anyone this before. So to develop a relationship over a period of time with someone who had been so important in your childhood was amazing, really. It's a privilege sometimes for us, isn't it, to, to talk to people that we admire. Absolutely. And, and sometimes, and especially when it feels like that develops into a conversation, it's always interesting. Oh, when almost you... a friendship, almost a friendship, mm. well, particularly mm. over a period of time. If you keep going back to see this person, Vic Armstrong, I, 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 I ghost wrote Vic Armstrong's memoirs. And they've oh, wrote, there's, there's another book Armstrong. I've read. There's another book yeah, I've read. Um, what an amazing man he was. What a great book that is. That took about five years to write, not wow. because it took five years to write, but because, you know, for six months he'd be off shooting a, a movie. Mm. So uh, there wasn't much time to actually sit him down and, and get stuff going. So it, it took a long time. But that became has become a friendship. I'm still in touch with him today, you know, and um, what a great guy he is. And that was a, priv a privilege to, to write that, to help somebody like that, you know, put his put his life story his life work on, you know, on to, you know, a document, you know, to create a document about his life. You know, it's real, 
responsibility that you, you feel to to be asked to do that. You know, you you got to. It's very difficult to ghostwrite because you can't write it as you would a normal book because you have to write it in the way that they're talking, mm. in a way to get mm. the voice of that person, which is quite difficult when you're ghostwriting. But with someone like Vic, who's a great storyteller, you should get him on your podcast. Oh no, he's writers, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, yes, he's specifically writers, isn't it? But he's a great um, storyteller. Yeah, that was a that was a, a a pleasure and a privilege to to work with Vic on that, and and to be welcomed into his home and family for you know over the course of five years. Yeah, he picked me up at the station and take me back because I don't drive, you see. So I felt like a complete hanger on. You know, he picked me up and drive me back to the station. Yeah. No, that, that book begins begins with him sort of in the rafters of the you know Blofeld's um layer and and yeah and then goes all the way on to the indiana jones films and absolutely you know. that was his second movie you know, twice i think yes yeah yeah i think he only got it because he was um his, his surname was a armstrong because they're probably flicking through the through the stunt you know register or whoever's black book they've got with, with contacts and they look at the first name armstrong give him a call no no, no that's how he got on a message secret service that's not how he got secret um you know, twice. That's how we got on a message secret service. Yeah. They must have just gone to A and he happened to be in. Because if he wasn't in, they would have gone to B and got somebody else. And that was a huge that was that was one uh, quite a breakthrough for him to do Secret Service. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great book. You know, yeah. And again, just full of anecdotes. That's that's, that's basically what it is. You know, so we don't go into, you know, what this means or what that means. Isn't that the thing that if you put those stories together, you get what, what it means come comes up anyway. You yes. don't need to. I, I totally agree with you. Totally mm-hmm. agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you need. Sometimes it's difficult because if you're writing a book on whatever um, and you're thinking, should I sometimes because sometimes you have to analyze something because it's mm. there. You have to talk about it. In, in an analytical way, why this happened and what it meant. Yeah, sometimes you have to do that. But there's other times where you don't. You say, look, it, it, it speaks for itself. You know, by the time you've ended the book, um, you sort of know what's going on or what it means. So, yeah, yeah. So I agree with that. Yeah, yes, yes. And it's also, I'm quite lazy and I'm not very good at it. I'm not very good at, <laughs> I'm not very good at sort of, you know, really going into psychological deep stuff. I'm not that kind of writer because I because I'm not very good. I can't I can't do it. So I I I I, I fall back on silly anecdotes. I don't know. I mean, I, I sort of think people are what they do. So it's uh, you know you t- you tell tell me what p- these people do, and I'll kind of know who they are. You know, it's mm-hmm. um... yeah. But that's again going back to the journalism thing. You know, it's it's not I'm not I'm not a sight and sound coerced to cinema. Because I remember when I was when I worked at the Vintage Magazine shop. Do you remember a shop called the Vintage Magazine shop? No, where's that? It was that? a film shop. It was a movie shop in London. I worked right. there for about two years. Again, because I love film. So if I was going to mm. work anywhere, I was going to work in a movie. It was a memorabilia shop. They sold, you know, posters and stills and things like that. And I remember there was the guy, manager there, and he was a real sight and sound guy. And I used to get film review. <laughs> we couldn't be more different, you know. And he said, no, no, I like I, when you read a, re- read a review or an article, it's all about the meaning of a film, like an interview with the director, whoever, whatever director it is, it's about what he... And sometimes it isn't the meaning, is it? It's, it's like the, the person's making it up, you know. It's not... I, th- I think it's all fake. I think that it's all fake. Because um, I, I remember... I'm a big Bond fan, as you probably know, and there's a very insightful... Um, review of Doctor No. When Doctor No first came out, um, it was obviously quite controversial because it was, you know, it was fairly vi- a violent film to some extent. Isn't it? You know, and there was a, and in- interestingly, it was Sight and Sound. Pretty sure it was Sight and Sound. Uh, the reviewer of Sight and Sound gave it a horrendous review, saying it was disgusting and violent. And he said it's disgusting because, and and what, but what do you expect from the director of Hammer horror films, Terence Fisher? He thought it was directed by Terence Fisher instead of Terence Young, so he based his entire review on the fact that he thought it was Terence Fisher directing it. There's something about that kind of journalist, doesn't it? That that um, you know, instead of taking something at face value, you 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 put it through your own prism, you know, instead of actually seeing it for what it is. Um, and there's another great example, the, the TV show The Prisoner. Um, you've got those amazing, uh, we, we all know the scenario of The Prisoner, don't we? It's Patrick McGowan, who's, who's sort of a prisoner in this village, and the, you can't, he can't escape. You are number six. You are, that's it, yes. Oh, I'm not a number. <laughs> I'm a free man. And if anyone tries to escape, this, this giant 
white balloon comes and comes and sort of smothers them, brilliantly parodied in a Simpsons episode. Um, and lots of people over the years would sort of what what's the the reason for the what, they would analyze what this white sphere means and the only reason it's in there was was because they had originally it was going to be a submersible vehicle that came out of the sea and sort of tracked people and it never worked the special effects people could never get it to work and while they were shooting that scene i think there was a weather station nearby and they saw these white balloons in the sky and they just had this idea of get 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 10 of those and I think the production assistant ran off to where this weather weather station was and brought back these these balloons. So they just got it because um, he just saw them floating in the sky. But you've got literally people wrote bloody books and theses on what these white balloons meant, you know. And I don't know if it's apocryphal, but but there's a film it was in colour and there, and there's a sequence in black and white. I don't again. I this may be apocryphal, but it, it's sort of it's 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 fuel to my argument. And there's one scene that's in black and white, and again, all the reviewers came out. What this white suddenly went into black and white, and there were all these these reasons for it. And they just ran out of money. They did. They just <laughs> they didn't afford black and white stock. I don't. As I say, I don't think. I don't know if that's apocryphal, but I did. It, it, it comes to mind. But uh, anyway, yeah, that's my rant. That's my rant over. There was a story about Sergio Leone making Fistful of Dollars and he bumped into like the most important film critic in Rome and the guy said to him, Leone, this is a masterpiece. What a brave movie. You've shot a Western entirely in red, the colour of blood. And he went, what do you mean entirely in red? And he <laughs> phoned up the um, the uh, developers and they basically it was a three-colour process and instead of mixing them and sending out the mix they sent out just one strip which was the red <laughs> the red color and he was sort of like do i tell this critic that that was a mistake <laughs> or do i uh, let him write his review under that misapprehension Fantastic. again it's looking at something through their own prism isn't it it's red therefore what does it mean and it, it doesn't mean anything it's, it's the wrong bloody it's come back from the printer's wrong you know and I, th I think the directors themselves you know, get a bit. You, there's lots of interviews, isn't there, where people have said, "Oh, does it? This film means that," and the director just says, "Well, no. It's it's, it's just entertainment. It's people can read into whatever they want." There's a great Peter Sellers film called After the Fox. Do you know? Do you know? Mm, you know yeah, that? yeah. It's shot in Italy. They're, well. they're, they're, they're they're criminals, aren't they? And they and they have to get this gold in from from the from a ship. So they go to this Italian village and they pretend to be shooting a movie. So and they pretend to shoot the the goal coming in, so people think it's it's part of the movie, but it's actually the heist happening yeah. before their eyes, kind of thing. And they're all caught at the end, and they're all in court, and they show the film on the screen, and it's just awful because obviously the person doing the cameraman can't. The, the, it's all going all over the place, and the editing's all over the place, and and everyone's looking at it in incredibly embarrassed in embarrassment, you know. And then the lights come up, and there's silence except for one film critic who stands up and applauds it as a masterpiece, <laughs> it's like you, Jean Luc Godard, you know. Yes. And, and I think that's a little, a little um, yes, yeah, a little dig, isn't it, of the the critics? So I, I approach books in that way, you know. Like so, like, let's just it's it's. You know, entertainment, isn't it? It's, it's just full of funny story. This is, you know, most of my books are. If you, if you look at them all, they're also very, very anecdotal in that way. Well, and and your new book, although it's sort of set up at 1971 as a series of reviews, even in in that there is a lot of stories in you know how the films come to be made and um, yeah. and the relationships uh, and and it's full of absolute gems. Again, this is this is why I'm going on about about if people think why well, is he talking about this? But but yeah, I mean because I could have approached this book in a very different way. I could have approached it looking at particularly because there's some very important films mm. uh, like Panic in Needle Park and Punishment Park and films on Vanishing Point where you know, people have written a lot of stuff about, and it, they're very, very important subjects like drugs and, um, you know, politics and things like that. But I'm just always looking for the funny story where somebody fell over or the camera, you know, the film came out of the camera. You know? But it's nice. That, I mean, I've had it when everyone, when everyone's dead because I've got, oh, because, you know, you need you need the, the, the people who are there and usually they've got funny things to say or interesting things to say because they were there. Whether I think I said somewhere that um, it doesn't matter. All, all, I mean, all of the great people are dead, and all of the directors are dead, and all of the great actors are dead from those films. So you're usually talking to the person who's the third assistant director or something. But they've gone on later on to be a 
have quite successful careers. But it doesn't matter. As if, I mean, you can make the coffee on the set of French Connection, but you were on the set of the French Connection. So, you know, you, you've probably got something valid and interesting to say. I interviewed the guy who was the location. He wasn't even the location manager, but he just went around looking for locations on clubs and French Connection. Pretty fantastic. Um, and he told me a, a very interesting story about Jane Fonda. You know, they, they found this place like a warehouse where they could build her, her apartment, the set of her apartment, the character that she was playing, who was this prostitute. And they built this um, apartment set in this sort of warehouse. And she said, um, I want to I want to stay in that set for two days and two nights. I want to live in that set for two days and two nights. So when we come to film on it, I know where everything is. And it's not it's not a mystery where the phone is or where the fridge is. So it's completely natural when I'm moving around in that in that space. And that's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, you never thought of that, of that, of, of, of you know, an actor's process working like that. Because if an actor comes onto a set and it's supposed to be your flat and your character's flat and you don't know where the fridge is, you're going to look sort of unnatural in there, aren't you? So it was brilliant. When you think about it, for Fonda to say, no, I'm going to stay there for two whole days. So I familiarize, familiarize myself with the environment. So it comes across on screen perfectly natural that, that this is my home. Yeah. So, yeah. Get, so I prefer things like that. I think that's very interesting, you know, from from a sort of a, an acting perspective. I loved one of the, uh, you know, speaking about talking to different people who, um, you know, you talk to a, an actor who plays the least famous and the youngest Droog in mm. Clockwork Orange. And that I thought that yeah. was a really interesting perspective to have. Yeah. Well, because I couldn't get Malcolm McDowell. But then again, he's everybody knows what Malcolm McDowell thinks. He's, he's spent the last 40 years talking about it. This is true. But if I got McDowell, but then the, this other guy's uh, memories and story were equally valid and, and would have been in the book as well because um, he was, it's interesting because he was the only, the only guy in the Droog's gang who was actually a kid. Because they're supposed to be kids, aren't they? They're supposed mm. to be young teenage or late teenagers, aren't they? But they're all in their mid-twenties, you know. Um, he was the only child. He was sort of 16 at the time. And, yeah, he, he gives illuminating uh, thoughts. On it. And also about Kubrick as well, talking about Kubrick. Can you imagine working with Kubrick for a year on that film? You really get to know him. And not many people got to know Kubrick, I can't imagine. So very interesting. Yeah, I love the way he suggests that he should re uh, um, Lord of the Rings as his next yes. film. Yeah, and, and I think he's, and Kubrick said, no, I'm not making Spartacus again. <laughs> I think meaning he didn't want to make a big epic kind of movie again. Yeah, it was just very interesting. Wow, that is that is, and I mean the range of films here. I mean, it's always going to be contentious when you say 1971, the you know the greatest year of, yep, of yep. cinema. But um, it's 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 a pretty good collection of movies. I mean, even the bad movies are amazing movies. You know, I mean, like yeah, I, that's what I thought. That's why I did. That's why because how to approach the 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 um the book and i came up with this concept of doing 100 films and i think that gives weight to the argument of of this being the, the greatest year because if you look at other years i think there's been a book hasn't there on 1999 there was a book a couple of years ago in 1962 which i've only just found out um i mean if you sort of look at 1939 or is an obvious candidate as well there's some amazing films but i don't think if you if, if by the time you get to like number 79 i think you can be scraping the barrel mm. but i think 1971 even though some films are weightier than others shall we say they're still fascinating and interesting so the, and i had no problem at all finding 100 films that's why there's a chapter there's a sort of an overspill because there's some really interesting films that that didn't quite make it of some and of some really bad films there's one film that in the end because there was nothing even more even remotely interesting about it to write but it was werewolves on wheels it, it was a, it was a biker werewolf movie <laughs> it sounds amazing doesn't it because that that final chapter was actually going to be called werewolves on wheels to sort of say that it's like the the worst of the, the best right. of the rest kind of the worst of the weird and the wonderful um, but researching it and, and it looked bloody awful and, and and there was nothing particularly interesting to say about it. So in the end, it, it never made it. That's but, it um, but it. But it was sort of, it was that, let's, let's put the weird and the wonderful in the final chapter. So there's some interesting stuff. And there's, there's people I interviewed as well from from that um, who um, who have got some great stories. Um, mm. Soul Kind, direct, who um, produced The light, Lighthouse, was it? The Light at the Edge of the World, it's Jules Verne film. Mm. Um, it's an incredibly violent movie, 
So he said something very interesting thing about star power, about how they got Kirk Douglas. You know, basically, before I even talk to you, you put two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in my Swiss bank account, and then we can talk. And then wow. he said, "Okay, um, maybe I'll think about it." Um, and now that I've committed to it, now you pay me a million dollars. But because you paid me a million dollars, you can now go around the world and say, "I have, we have Kirk Douglas to star in this movie," and that's the way that they raise the money. That's star. That's how you. That's how you get a star. <laughs> that's how you used to get stars in those days. Yeah. Yeah, so- absolutely. And then you have a like a. a, a I mean, there's such a. a, a- a wide range of, of um, films here. Yeah. You, I mean, Willy Wonka is is <laughs> one of those perennial favourites, but to read the book and realise that it's kind of, you know, it's so much happenstance involved in the making yes. of that film and that it was kind of like a big advert for a chocolate bar. It, it, it was, yes. It was uh, Mel Stewart who I interviewed. Well, I, I started doing this about 10 years. I had this idea about 10 years ago because some of these people are no longer with us. I interviewed mm. Robert Fuchs, who directed Abominable Dr. Fives, uh, he's, he's, he died a few years ago, so I managed to interview him, Ken Russell, and Michael Winner, and people like that. So I had this idea about 10 years ago, and it made sense to, would have made sense to have brought it out two years ago for the 50th, you know, in like 2021, but nobody wanted to publish it. It took me quite a while to find a publisher. Um, and um, so I had all these, I had these boxes of tapes. So when I interested this publisher, History Press, into doing it, I, I went back up into my loft to dig out the tapes that I'd done years ago when I had the original idea. And I was going through them. I, I saw one tape saying Mel Stewart. I thought, who the hell is Mel Stewart? And I put the tape on and to listen to it. Oh, oh it's the guy who directed Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a great story. I mean, he, he was with this. Um, with a partner called David Walper, and they had this documentary filmmaking company. They did documentaries. They didn't, they didn't make movies. They made adverts and documentaries. But one 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 morning, um, Mel Stewart's daughter came in and said she'd just finished reading this wonderful book, Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You must make a film of it, Daddy. He said, well, Daddy doesn't make films, makes documentaries and adverts, so I don't... But I'll, I'll read it. I'll, I'll have a look, because he was very enthusiastic about it, so maybe there's something here. So he read it, loved it, Next morning, he went into the office and gave it to his partner, Walpa, and said, read this, um, whether he did or not. But about a week later, they had a meeting at Quaker Oats because they did documentaries for them and, and, mm. and corp- corporate films and things like that. And they had this big meeting at um, Quaker Oats who were going to be bringing out this chocolate bar. And so they said, have you got anything about chocolate, a history of chocolate, or anything like that you can do? And then the little bell went off in their head and said, well, actually, there's this book called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And they loved the idea. And so the, the whole... that. The whole film was was financed by Quaker Oats to tie. It was a, a, basically a giant advert for their chocolate bar, which they persuaded them instead of Quaker chocolate bar, it became a Wonka bar, and it was a complete failure. The, the chocolate bar was a failure. <laughs> was the film, the film was a failure as well. Relatively, it wasn't right. a huge. It wasn't a huge success. It's only. In, you know, it's one of those films that sort of gathered pace later. You know, when it turned up on television and people started watching it, and and then. Fathers showed their, you know, generations and generations. Mm. And now it's this absolute, you know, classic movie, isn't it? Another one is Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, again from seventy one. Again, wasn't a huge success, but has become a film that you know fathers show to their children, and then the children show to their children, kind of thing. It's become this this wonderful, wonderful film. Yeah, there's another another great story from um, Mel, Mel Stewart. Said he was he was in his production office, and there was a knock on the door. And these, this this group of black guys came in who were who were from the Afro American um, acting union or committee or something, and they said, "We understand you're you're making um, a film with Charlie in the Chocolate Factory." And he said, "Yes, I am." He said, "Well, what are you going to do about the Umpa Lumpers?" Um, because, and it's in recent years, isn't it? There's all this this stuff about um, the books being censored, isn't it? They've been republished. The, the publishers have taken out certain things from Roald Dahl books, haven't they? Haven't they? Because they're quite quite um, contentious and if you read the original book the Oompa Loompas are the sort of pygmies aren't they have been captured by Wonka um, from the West Indies or, or wherever and brought to his chocolate factory and sort of made to work as slaves in, in the chocolate factory so so these the, um, the African American guys were saying uh, what are you going to do how are you going to represent the, these people on film how are you going to have them? and it hadn't occurred to Mel Stewart at all what he was, it hadn't it hadn't occurred to him how he's going to do this. It was obviously it's going to be very controversial if he represents it as it, as it is in the book. 
So he said, well, give me five minutes, guys, and I'll have a think. And literally, someone put on the spot. And he said, well, okay, let's, let's, I'll, give, I'll give them green hair and orange faces. How about that? So, And we all know now that the Oompa Loompas, that's what they look like. It's only yeah. because he was confronted by these guys saying, these these guys are racist as hell, and you can't you can't put them on the screen as they are in the book. And he was sort of forced into a corner and said, "Well, how am I going to get?" Them? And, he came and they up with changed the time. They were responsible for changing the title they were, as well. But they left. They left, and the, the one guy before he closed the door, almost as an after afterthought, I think he said, "You know, and by the way, you do know what Charlie means, don't you?" And he said, "No, but I'm sure you're going to tell me." Mm. <laughs> and he said, "Well, in 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 uh, the days of slavery, Charlie was sort of the guy who ran the plantations. He sort right. of the, ruled the roost over the slaves. So obviously, the connotation and in, in the black community of the word Charlie is, is quite is quite tender and raw." And and Mel said, oh, look, "I've given you the umpa lumpas. <laughs> so what, what, what the hell do you?" And he said, "Look, let me let me look. Give me give me a couple of days. I'll I'll, I'll sleep on it." And he went back home, and I think he must have been it was in his head while he was driving home, and he was thinking what to do about it. And um, I, th- I think he must have thought, well, the character, the main character is Willy Wonka, which sounds – I think he visualised what it would look like on a marquee, and he, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Actually, look, looking on a marquee looks looks better, and people will probably mm. remember it. Charlie, you get a, you get lost. It's, mm. it's a woman's perfume as well, Charlie. And it might, but Willy Wonka is something you remember. Um, so yeah, he changed the title because of wow. that, and Roald Dahl objected strongly, but he sold the rights so they could do anything they want, basically. So they changed it, so he became Willy Wonka. And I think people today think the book is called Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, don't they? They're surprised when it isn't. And of course, you mentioned earlier that uh, you're a big Bond fan, and you've got a Bond film in here. Yes, not the best one. Not the best one, it has to be said, but historically. Again, this is this is the thing about seventy one. Is it's a lot of history going on. Very lots of significant things are happening. So you've got Sean Connery's last official bond, and you've got the, the start of the black exploitation movement with Shaft, Sweet Backs Badass Song. You got Billy Jack, um, absolutely, and you've got sort of the start really of the of the martial art fad with Bruce Lee's first movie, The Big Boss. You've got Spielberg's first movie, you've got George Lucas's first film as a director. It's quite remarkable, really. What's going on? Sergio Leone, you mentioned earlier, Fistful of Dynamite, which was his last Western and his, his last film for about 10, 10, 12 years, wasn't it? Once Upon a Time in the West was his next film. Once Upon a Time in America, yes. In America, yes. But it was his last Western. Yeah. Um, yeah. Significant stuff happening. What do you What do you make of Diamonds, uh, Diamonds Are Forever? I like then, it. Your... I like it. Yeah. I mean, it's cheesy as hell. Um, mm. It used to be my favourite Bond film when I was young. Don't know why. I think it had moon buggies in it and stuff. And it was silly. And it was quite adult, wasn't it, in a way? Because it was quite dark. It was quite bloody, wasn't it? It was quite mm. violent. I, I still think it's probably one of the funniest scripts. It's a very funny script. It's the first one where there's a is a, the writer comes in who's very young as well. It's like Mankiewicz, an American yeah. writer. Mankiewicz, Mankiewicz. yeah. Oh, I interviewed uh, one of the best interviews I've ever had. I, oh, I, right. um, I interviewed him for my Broccoli Saltzman Bond producer's book. And I interviewed him for the Hollywood Hellraiser as well, because he was a good friend of Dennis Hopper going on a tangent. But it's still 1971, the last movie, the Dennis mm. Hopper film, uh, which was chaos. And I might do a film about that. I think there's, I think there is a documentary. But Mankiewicz was very good friends with uh, Hopper. Um, and he went to Taos in New Mexico where... Hopper had, had a house. He had a, a compound, and not where they filmed last uh, movie, but where they were in post production, where he was editing, and where he took about eight months to edit it because all sorts of stuff was happening. They were on drugs, and God knows what, what, what was going on. And he, he he went and stayed two days there, and he said he left thinking everybody in that house, everybody in that compound is going to die. There's no no one will be left because they're taking so much, you know, industrial amounts of cocaine and goodness knows what that you know i'll come back six months later and there'll, there'll be nobody left but um so it's a great story and some funny stories from diamonds are forever as well that um when harry saltzman because connery said i'll do it but i don't want to see saltzman i think it was it wasn't in the contract but i think connery wanted it put in the contract that saltzman mustn't step a foot on the stage and if he sees him He's, he's he's not going to be happy. I don't think it was in the contract. But why um, why did he hate him so much? I, 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 well, he didn't didn't like either of them, did he? But I think he took partic- particular umbrage with Saltzman. I think he had a slightly better 
our relationship with Broccoli, but still bad by the, at the end. Mm. But I just, I just, their personalities, I think, just clashed. I never um, quite this... understood where the animus came from. I mean, I knew that he, well, I, he I, should I, have been I, paying... money, money, yeah. money, because they were taking shit loads of money. Which Connery had signed a, a pretty, pretty poor. Well, I mean, he was an unknown actor, wasn't he, when he came in to do Bond? Well, he's not going to get a million dollars, is he, for Doctor No? He's got six thousand. It, it it got better by Goldfinger, but it still was. I mean, by by then, literally, literally um, Broccoli and Saltzman were literally carrying suitcases of money to Switzerland, you know, and putting it into bank accounts and things. I mean, the money that was that was coming in from marketing and it was ridiculous. And of course, all those stuff in the sixties, all those toys and games that came out, lunch boxes, you name it, they all had Connery's mug on them. He didn't get a penny, a penny for this. And so I think he resented the fact that the, the producers were making so much money and he was just getting a decent wage, but not nowhere near what they were getting. So I think I think um he thought it was unfair, unbalanced that the, the, the producer were making so much money out of him. Because he by then he was the face of Bond. Um and there's a story that somebody told me on the set of Journey Live twice. He he was performing a scene, Connery and, and Saltzman walked on and Connery stopped mid-sentence and didn't carry on until Saltzman walked off and then he carried on. By, by then it was was bad, yeah. But no, I'm a fan of Diamond. Diamonds, yeah, I'm a, I am a fan of Diamond. But I like all Bond films. I think my, someone said, what's the worst Bond film? And I couldn't think of one. Even the worst Bond film is you stick it on and you have you enjoy it. Oh, there's always there's always fun to be had. Definitely, there's always fun to be had. Um, I, I'm uh, I'm a big fan of the the recent Craig ones. Um, yeah, no, no, they, I think they're terrific. I mean, even <laughs> stuff like Another Day and and The View to a Kill, which are people say Quantum of Solace thing, the, the, the ones that they if you haven't seen them for a while, you stick them on because they're, they're still Bond films. Quantum of Solace is a hill that I will die on. I, I think that's a really oh, you're, under- one of, you're one of them, are you? <laughs> it's an underrated film. I think it's a really spanking ninety minute. Doesn't hang around. Does it mm. make sense? No. no. Yeah, I, Does, do, do you go to Bond movies for them to make sense? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I watched it again recently, and and yeah, I I I I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I thought I thought it was good. It has some so, real standout yeah. moments in it. Um, yeah, and he's very good. Craig Craig's terrific in it, isn't he? Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. In the of the 1971 films, what was was there a film that you sort of previously hadn't had much um, knowledge of, or that you you kind of reconsidered, or you had a diff- you you changed opinion when you sort of rewatched well, a it? Lot, in the context? A lot. I was familiar with a lot of them because I'm sort of a film film nerd, and so since I was young watching movies. Mm. Um, we were very lucky in the 1980s because suddenly turning up on TV were all these films from the 70s. Mm. So you'll appreciate it. So Clute was on at nine o'clock on a Monday night or the last picture show or something. So I sort of you know, grew up watching 70s films because they were being shown on the TV for the first time. Um, but obviously doing this doing this um, book, you know, I did a real you know deep dive in, into it and um, came up with films I'd frankly never heard of. Or, or films that I I knew of, um, mm. or but they got sig- the significance that I didn't know, like Two Lane Blacktop and things like that that had you know have huge significance, um, or are highly thought of, you know, and even films that some um, I, I guess were sort of thrown out there and are now are now so revered, like some a film like Ten Wellington Place, which probably came out in 1971 and was just shown for a couple of weeks at your local ABC and then then you know, vanished, but is now seen as a, a masterful film and one of, mm. one of the great performances by Dickie Attenborough as, as Crippen. It's an astonishing film. And I interviewed Richard's son, Michael, told me some wonderful stories about um, about his dad working on that film. He went, to the, he went to the studio once to have lunch because usually Attenborough let his family come, come and see him when he was working, but when he was doing Crippen, when he was doing Willington Place, he forbade them to come. So I think... Because he was, he wasn't a method actor, but he, but he he did get into the character, and he stayed in the character all day, pretty much. Mm. So he wouldn't have been a bag of laughs. <laughs> he was, he was crippled, you know. And it's and, and he, he noticed when he went home, he, he that that it still the shadow was still, this dark cloud was still over him, when, even when he came home, you know. This this because he had been, you know, inhabiting this horrendous person, and it and it stayed on him for 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 months afterwards. But Michael went to see him one one, one lunchtime, and um, 
Attenborough was speaking with the voice of Crippen, and he, he was in full makeup, and he, and and he just it was like having lunch with with Crippen. No, it's not Crippen, isn't it? What am I talking about? It's Christie. Sorry, it's it's Christie. It's not Crippen. Crippen is a is a, is he the Victorian? Yes, right. Uh, yes, yes. No, it's Christie. It's Christie. It's because right. because they begin with C. I'm, I'm easily yes. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's Christie. It's Christie, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, John Christie. So it's like having lunch with John Christie. Yeah, or Crippen. What? <laughs> but they were, were both boards as well. They but they're both their surnames begin with C and they were both boards. So you can't and they wore bold glasses, so you can't you can't blame me for getting and, and murdered people. And they murdered people yeah. as well. So yeah. come on, you know, give exactly. me, give me a <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so I mean, it's it's perhaps uh, too hard a question to ask. What would be your favourite film from this from this collection? But um, favourite the... films, you'd have to put an S on the end of that. I'm afraid, yeah. because because um, it's I mean, it's so I mean, you've got the Devils, you've got Each Connection, you've got Dirty Harry, um, Death in Venice, Get Carter. Um, Get Carter's brilliant, isn't it? Every time I see it, it gets better. There's a good story actually from from that. There's the scene at the beginning when they're watching the the, the mucky movies. The um, the son of Michael Klinger, the producer who I interviewed for the book, was going out with a girl at the time, and she took him back to her uncle's pad in Lancaster Gate, and it was so swanky. And he thought this will do for the for the opening scene with the gangsters in in the, in this in this sort of London apartment. And he asked her, you know, who lives there. And she's because we'd love to use it in the movie. And she said, "Okay, well, what's the film?" He said, "It's a gangster film." And she laughed because her uncle was a gangster, was a London gangster, and they and that's the that's the apartment that they used. So it's actually used, it belonged to a London gangster. And his only caveat for them using the the apartment was that Michael Caine had to come round one evening for dinner, and then he'd let them use the flat. So I think Caine had to go and have dinner with. His, with this gangster, but <laughs> but I think I think Kane knew quite a few London gangsters. I think I imagine it was be unavoidable to to be such indeed. a London indeed. a London figure. Indeed, indeed. But there's so many great stories like that. I mean, there's there's another wonderful story from um, again one of these films that I sort I sort of discovered, which was Two Hundred Motels, which is the Frank Zappa. Oh, Mother yeah. of the Pensions film, um, which was directed by Tony Palmer, who I spoke to, and it's this incredibly surreal movie and the surrealness was i mean what the uh, the bass player i mean it's like the, the mother's invention of frank zappa's backing man right. basically and they play themselves in the movie um but the bass player sort of had an argument and, and refused to be in the film so they had to cast the someone to be the bass player and for some reason don't ask me why but tony palmer who directed it told me that they chose wilfred bramble of steptoe and son you would have thought would be the last person you would cast as a bass player. But the, the joke was he was he was the oldest bass player in the world kind of thing. But it, if, if you've seen the film, it fits in with the movie because the movie doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, anyway, and, and poor old Wilfred did all these rehearsals and read the script. And finally, before they started f- shooting, he, he walked out. Mm. He thought, this is, doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. I've never understood what it means. And he walked out. So they were... They had about four days to recast, and they were all sitting around in the studio, in this room in the studio, and they couldn't think of who to cast. And some, either Frank Zapp or somebody said, look, the next person to walk in through that door gets the part. They were all looking at the door waiting for someone to come in. And the person who came in was Ringo Starr's chauffeur, who'd gone out to get some cigarettes. Ringo Starr was in the film. He'd asked right. this guy to go out and get some fags. And he came back with the cigarettes and thought, right, you're the bass player in the film. <laughs> He had four days to learn the part, and he's in the film. So these are stories you'd only get from the from the people who were actually there. You know, yeah. once they're gone, those stories are gone, aren't they? So you're you're yeah. kind of curating a legacy, and you it's a, it's, yeah, I think you know. so. I think so. Yeah, particularly because I mean, I'm looking back and um, I'm rewriting my ITC book because mm. that's published next year. Republished. It came out about ten years ago. Mm. And I'm I'm rewriting bits of it, and it's coming out again next year. And half the people are bloody dead. Mm, mm. I interviewed yeah. Roger's gone, Tony Curtis, Peter Wingard, Jerry Anderson, yeah, so yeah. Alexander Bastido, who was in the Champions. So many people I interviewed have passed on. So it's, it's very sad. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's very... almost a legacy thing of, of getting them down, getting getting their memories down of what were very important. Now seen as historical, aren't they? Almost because these things are shown at the BFI and stuff like that, aren't they? They are, they are now part of our, of our culture, our cultural history, and legacy. 
they were throwaway back in the 60s, weren't they? They were on at eight o'clock. People watched them after they had their dinner and they forgot about them, but now they're sort of revered works of art, these things. Yeah. There's another good story. I've got lots of stories. There's another good story from Walkabout. Again, um, um, what an amazing film, Walkabout. Oh, had an that, amazing that's 1971 as well. 71, yeah. Oh. Had an amazing effect on me as a child, that film. Um, again, you know, would, probably I saw it the first time it was on, because it was a great thing in the Radio Times. It was, they put the, the film and then, and then in brackets, first time on British television. I thought, oh, that's mm-hmm. so exciting. Gave added impetus to watch it. So I must have been the first showing, and I must have been about six, five or six, and it's a remarkable film. And people know it's, it's about Jenny Agatha plays a young girl and, and her son, which is played by the, the son of the... Her brother, director. her brother, yeah. That's right. Um, and they get lost in the outback, and they, they come across an Aborigine who's on walkabout, and he shows them back to civilization. And 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 but while they're there, you know, they they're, they're sort of living this outback life, and it's a it's there's some very uncomfortable footage of animals being killed, unfortunately, but it's such a visual film, and and Nicholas Rogue, so it's very visual, um, it, that amazing. He's one of the most visual directors, isn't he? It's, 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 it's almost century, you know, it's, it's overpowering in its, in its imagery. And I interviewed somebody who was on the camera crew and they, they were filming somewhere in the outback and they, they, they found this cave. And so they asked the art director to go into this cave and just draw some Aborigine, Aboriginal art, you know, like, uh, you know, animal, like, like you see cave, cave drawings in France and you know, animals and you know, spear people throwing spears and stuff, and then the, and then they shot there, and then about two months later they had to go back to the same region to do something else. And in that time, a local businessman had had opened the cave up to tourists to look look at these amazing Aboriginal cave drawings, and he was charging people to go in, and they just thought that was very amusing. <laughs> Whether it's still, I mean, I wonder, I wonder if he told them. Excuse me, we did that, or, or maybe now. If you go there now, and you go, if you go to see these amazing, they might, they might not be the real ones. They might have been done because they might still be there, and they might still be charging an awful lot of money to see them. I don't know. Well, uh, listen, Robert, I've got one last question to ask you, which is a question I ask everybody, every guest, which is, um, would you recommend a uh, a film book? Uh, for us, so some, a film book that you've enjoyed and that maybe our re- our listeners can can enjoy as well. And it and it's not mine, not one of mine, not one of yours, if possible. Um, probably Kenneth Anger's Hollywood Babylon. Right, right. Well, there's an anecdotal um, book. If you, yeah, if that... I mean that's a great that that had a. I think that influenced me a lot in the way the way to make into my, my books. Um, again, I'm not not sure how much of that is strictly true. But, and there's a sequel as well, isn't there? There's another one. But the first one is fantastic. Mm. Even if it's even if half of it's not true, it's it's a great read, um, and it really does. If 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 it's not factual, it does paint a picture, and it certainly gives gives um, the color of what it was like in in early Hollywood. It's uh, and there's a lot of sort of scandal stuff about Fatih Arbuckle and all that mm. kind of stuff. Mm. People who uh, sort of poor actress who was out of work for years and walk to the top of the Hollywood sign and jumped off it. And it's all those kind of stories, you know, the dark side, the seedy side of Hollywood. Mm. And yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a, that's a, the first time that's ever been uh, recommended. That's a great recommendation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember and there's a lot of nice pictures in it as well. There's yeah. a, there's a picture of an actor, an old actress who was found like uh, two weeks after she died and after her cats had had a go. So there's a lot of very oh my god pictures in it as well disturbing pictures. He's a, he's an interesting character in himself. He was yeah I mean I, did he do a did he do a film in seventy one I don't think so he did, no. he did a bunch of movies didn't he I'm not sure if it's yes I don't think because there's a lot rising. of sort of counterculture type movies in seventy one mm. there's uh, you know, Andy Warhol movies and things like that there's a lot mm. of counterculture stuff going on um, which is awful now to look at but but I, I guess. <laughs> Is sort of a documentary of the past, you know. It's like you're you're looking at a at a a, a time in history, and it's there recorded for you to go back and look at. Mm. Not, not necessarily enjoy, but certainly for educational purposes, to, to see what life was like. 
Well, listen, Robert, thanks so much for talking to me. And thanks so much for the book. 1971 is a, a, a you make a very convincing argument. And even if other people might disagree or agree, it doesn't really matter because the stories are so I, good. I think that was one of, another reason for writing it, to, to sort of create this debate. And it was fascinating because about a month ago, I went on to uh, BBC Radio London and they did a call in and um, everybody who phoned in had a different year, um, which is which maybe which is lovely in a way, because it's like there, there isn't really a greatest year of cinema. It's like there isn't a greatest album. There isn't a greatest football player. There isn't a greatest song. It's all personal opinion, personal taste and personal choice, isn't it? Um, if you have six people in a room and say, what's the greatest song ever written? You're going to have six different answers, aren't you? And sometimes it's a very, it's a very personal thing as well, isn't it? I think why for me, seventy one. I think because because you know watching all these films growing up as a kid. Um, I remember watching Shaft when it was on for the first time. It was on at half past nine, and I wasn't allowed to watch it. And it's, I was watching a very adult movie, you know, because it was, it was and the French Connection as well. You know, this was a very adult movie, and it was it was a great, but it is a great film. You know, I mean, it's it's a lot of those films you go back to and you think, oh, it was not as good as I thought it was. But most of these films, um, you go back and watch them and they're just as good as they were, you know, because they're great movies. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. Thanks so much, Robert. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thanks very much. I, I really enjoyed it. So that was me and Robert talking about his book, 1971. Uh, let me just get the uh title of that absolutely correct wait a second i'm going to google that and give you the title as it should be the title is a hundred films from cinema's greatest year there you go 1971 a hundred films from cinema's greatest year his recommended book was kenneth anger's hollywood babylon which i think i'm right in saying hasn't been recommended before but um i might be wrong <coughs> i'm not entirely sure but i think it hasn't hasn't been recommended before this week I've had a terrible bout of COVID, so I've been mostly inside, although I had an opportunity to interview Tim Burton, and that interview will be uh, published uh, in coming weeks in The Times, which was a lot of fun to do. What else have I been watching this week? Uh, I finally got uh, a chance to watch um, And Your Mother as well, the Spanish title of which is Y Tu Mama Tambien. I, I can't pronounce Spanish, so I apologize immediately for everybody, uh, which is uh, Alfonso uh, Cuaron's kind of it's an, kind of an anti coming of age story uh, where um, his very uh, young Diego Luna and uh, I think it's uh, Gabriel Garcia Bernal. Let me just check that as well. Uh, it's from 2001. Gael Garcia Bernal and Diego Luna, along with Maribel Verdú. Um, it's a brilliant film. It's a real sort of um, anti-coming-of-age story in the sense that everybody, nobody kind of learns anything. It's it's uh, the, the 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 two young men starts off almost like a, a, a if it was in English language, you'd be thinking it was a sort of super bad American Pie, uh, you know, guys getting off with an older woman. Um, jealousy and friendship and all that sort of stuff but because it's uh, made by superior hands I would argue um, it goes off into the you know the homoerotic subtexts where where someone like Jed Apatow might might not dare to venture and in the end it has this kind of it also has this kind of laconic nihilistic um, narration which is telling you uh, about all the terrible things that are happening in the future as well as uh, in the present and sort of everything all the sunshine of mexico casts these these terrible shadows over over what's happening and you keep seeing them pass policemen and stuff so it's uh, who are stopping other people and, these, and, you, and you get a real sense that these people are uh uh, in some ways really privileged um, and it's something that I think goes all the way through Quaron's work if you watch Roma I think it's a fantastic film I think the film is in some ways despite all the praise heaped upon it is a little bit underrated he's he's so aware of his own privilege there's no sense that he's looking at Mexico and thinking he's looking at it through eyes which are which are anything other than sort of middle class upper middle class and he's lived a life of of, of 
privilege and uh and in some sense has been cushioned from the the many woes of his country uh but but here as well it's, it's a really it's fascinating really really fascinating film i think that was probably one of the best films i watched this this week i did also watch uh i'm going through the um the Nick and Nora films, uh, the Thin Man movies, and so I've watched a couple more of those, uh, Thin Man Again and Thin Man Af- After the Thin Man, and they're just delightful. They're just absolutely, William Powell and Myrna Loy are just, uh, I, I can just watch them till the, the, you know, till the cows come home, or till Asta barks. Um, one of the more annoying dogs in film history, and I know that might be uh, uh, sacrilege to say, but there is a bit of me that sort of thinks, "Oh my God, this is sort of like this is the snappy do of the uh, of the series." Try to think of, of other films I've seen this week. Wait a second, I'll go and get my uh, my letterbox. Oh, I watched French Lieutenant's Woman, which was okay. Uh, Devil's Candy. The Addiction was very good. Abel Ferrara film about vampires in the uh, 90s. Um, just uh, Ferrara had such a great patch um, in the uh, in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, where he was watching. A whole bunch of well, he was making sorry a whole bunch of films like Funeral and King of New York, um, where he was really at the top of his game. And even though his private life was a complete shambles in this time, he was on a lot of drugs. Um, he was making these really interesting and kind of quite disciplined, tight films. Bad Lieutenant is another one that uh, pops to mind. Um, so yeah, so I kind of got some some good uh, some good. Also, the Wes Anderson Roll Down movies. I've watched Poison and um, Henry Sugar so far. I think he's really um, that's a that's a seam where, where he's perfectly found his his measure and uh, you know he. I think the short story is he he could be one of cinema's great short storytellers because I think he's. Uh, uh, his aesthetic is perfectly um that's the portion you know it's like um i don't know it's like something like a really nice tiramisu you just want enough you know you don't want too much and i know lots of people are going to be shrieking oh i want gallons of tiramisu but you don't you really don't you want to you know if it's really nice you want exactly the right amount you don't want any more and you don't want any less obviously um Anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd add that as a sort of little bit of a bonus at the end of the episode. Or you've already stopped listening, which is which means it's no no harm, no foul. Um, thanks so much for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week. Uh, take care.